I'm going to try and keep a, a time table here. Um, so All right. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, we are so excited um, to be hosting this with Leonardo. I'm Sophie, um, an artist liaison with the Lumen Prize. Um, and this talk series is hosted um, in part um, with Leonardo, um, in part of our exhibition um, that was recently debuted last week. Um, and I will put a link in the chat um, if anyone would like to follow along as each artist um, talks about their work um, in the context of the exhibition. Um, and just for context, um, I'm gonna wait for more people I'll just to make sure everyone. Um, but just for context, um, Leonardo is the International Society for Arts, Sciences and Technology. Um, and they've been cultivating transdisciplinary research since about 1968 um, through a partnership with Arizona State University. Um, and they published scholarly texts in the US and they kind of serve um, as a critical content provider um, through publications, scholarly, scholarly journals um, and books um, published through MIT Press. And the Lumen Prize, um, we celebrate the best of art created with technology through a global competition uh, of which the three artists with us today were a part this past year. Um, and we were launched in 2012 um, by our founder, Carla. Um, and we've given away more than 80,000 in prize money. And um, we're also run by our parent Lumen uh, Art Projects, which is a not-for-profit based in, the, in Wales, UK. Um, which creates exhibitions, commissions, and events. Um, so yeah, I am very excited to have three of our award-winning artists with us today. 
Um, we have Liliana Farber, um, who took home the Still Image Award. We have Juliette Hill, um, who took home our Top Gold Award. And we have Soren Craig, who took home um, our Nordic Award this year, which premiered this year as well. Um, so I want to start by introducing um, Liliana. Um, uh, who will be talking about her work, Terum in, Ex in Espectu. Um, Liliana is a new media artist born in Uruguay, who's currently based in New York. Um, and I will let her take it away. And I'm gonna pin her video so we can see her. Hi, Liliana. Um, so can you see my screen? Um, I think that's a yes. You're good. Okay. Um, so um, the work, Terra uh, Spectrum, it is around um, phantom islands, but more broadly about um, our belief in information systems and particularly in how we present, how we understand the world um, in in science, in law, and uh, in also in our collective uh, consciousness. Um, I was always interested in maps uh, coming from um, a place um, that was um, colonized um, multiple times. There was wars all the times between uh, Spain and Portugal. And I, and I love to go to the museums of maps and seeing how, how the place was portrayed um uh, by european so um here you see a map uh, from uh, 1562 by uh, diego gutierrez and um of the of the americas and when you see this map um it kind of um, it, it is kind of obvious to us uh the mistakes no uh it is obvious that there is a lot of uh, fantasies uh, and fictions involved. You have, you have the illustrations, you have the gigantic rivers. Um, but when you see um, Google, uh, Google Earth um, images, somehow we are more prone to, to believe as truthful the information that is uh, presented before ourselves. And uh, Google Earth, I am, as you know, as many other technologies recycle different kind of information that it was passed, that it was collected from other times, that it was recycled and, so, and from other times and so on and so on. So um, I am interested in finding these, uh, these moments and how uh, new technologies replicate uh, same biases and, and same and, and problematics as older forms of uh, collecting, classifying and displaying information. Uh, so in, in this case, in this screenshot, uh, there was a hole where, with information of Sandy Island, and Sandy Island um, is a phantom island. So uh, phantom islands, that is what this project is about, uh, are bodies of land that were uh, represented for many, many years in maps, but they never existed. And there are different reasons of how these uh, places became to, to be part of what people understood as the world. And sometimes are, you know, um, scientific errors. Sometimes people, uh, if there was like a lower cloud or like an iceberg, they mistook it from an island. Well, sometimes they thought they saw something, but it wasn't, they were like, they were, uh, the geolocation that you know, the coordinates didn't match and they were seeing something else. And sometimes there were uh, completely uh, lies, uh, people that wanted to expand their, their imperia or having a place for an, uh, with their name. And, um, uh, you know, and sometimes there were mythologies. Uh, so for example, we have um, a, a Atlantis or Thule that are mythological islands. So my project started, this is the photo of my studio, um, 
uh, looking, thinking of where are these islands and who discovered them, who undiscovered them, or I mean, who who included them in maps and who uh, realized these places were never uh, existed. And you know, this story about uh, these places. And what I wanted to do, it was uh, what I did, it was um, to train um, um, machine learning algorithm with images from Google Earth to try to understand the language or the mathematical language of uh, Google Earth um, satellite photography. Uh, and to um, in, um, sort of uh, to trick viewers um, uh, with uh, showing places as Google Earth photography that never existed, um, sort of to expose how these uh, databases, uh, how these technologies can be manipulated and, um, and to break up um, the, the belief that we have in these um, in these uh, forms of the representation. Uh, there is something about about this kind of uh, photography, you know, satellite photography, that we tend to believe more of this uh, truthfulness or sort of the, the attach of a uh, bias. Um, but these uh, these images are, are made by you know uh, machines and algorithms that are designed for a specific purpose, and, and they carry all the you know uh, political um, um, you know um, uh, perspectives of of the designers in a way. So the process started um, by collecting. Uh, you know, a real island in, in Google Earth, uh, I, I sort of uh, around 500, and I had to uh, remap them um, uh, to use an algorithm that uh, it's called pick to picks that learns uh, the, it works with an input and an output, the input being uh, Google Earth uh, photography and the output being the maps that are created of these, of these uh, screenshots. And so in this way, it, uh, the algorithm learned the relationship between a linear image and um, a satellite-like representation. Um, and so this was, um, uh, I, I documented the process that I had working with the algorithm. Um, I wanted to arrive to uh, the most truthful looking um, a result. So I had to, I had to work with, um, with several um, settings and, and trying different ways um, using a little heart to, to see how much uh, close I can get to, um, to an image that really looks taken from, from Google Earth. And so um, as an example, we have here the, the island of Taprobana. This was uh, thought to be actually a very big island at the south of India. And this is uh, here. This is the trace that I create of, of, the, orig of the map that I took from, from the original records. And this is uh, my result. And each image has, um, I, I, I place at the bottom uh, the name of the island, the, the geolocation where it, uh, where it was thought to be, and the years um, from, from when it started to, be, to appear in maps and to where uh, it, um, it started to disappear. So in this case, uh, this is more like a, a mythological place. It is not known um, where uh, it was proven to not exist. But for me, what is interesting is that um, the latest one that was proven as non existent was in uh, 2015. It was Jupiter Reef. And this was uh, 10 years after uh, uh, Google Earth uh, was launched. But uh, Google Earth was, was bought uh, from Keyhole um, uh, Inc., that it was live before. So we, we have almost 15 years of satellite photography uh, of our planet. And, and we still have you know, these kind of mistakes. 
and, and for me, this is very important because not to not to to show um, um, this the problematic of this of of trusting so much uh, these information systems. And um, but in another in another hand, I, I do like that these these problems exist that these that there are, there are these um, these moments um, of of error of breakingness uh, because um, I wonder why why should Google or any other information system should contain um, the whole information of the world and who gets to decide especially talking about uh, geopolitics what are the borders and you know what are what are the land's definitions and and should we have if if we, if we, if if there was such thing that will complete, that will completely contain accurately information, who should be in charge or maintaining or, um, you know, deciding all these things? Um, so these are a few of the islands. Um, this one is my favorite. Um, there was thought to be uh, a tiny island in the in the North Pole, and sort of like a bottom of the world. Um, and this is how I present it in the physical space and here how we can, you can see it in the in a Lumen online exhibition. But um, if you go to my pavilion, um, you will see that before entering the space, there are some texts uh, floating around kind of um, that you have to go through in order to, to uh, access these images. And this is a work that is called The Island. Um, it is, let me see, let me see. it is a, a publication uh, that I made um, with um, sort of was a collage uh, of text, sort of like a cadaver exquisite of all the, um, um, uh, the records taken from logbooks of the captains that uh, either discovered these islands or the ones that discovered these islands to be non-existent. So I was very interested in, in how these, these um, fake places become to be. And so I went to the records and, uh, and see where uh, the technology that is involved, the desire, uh, the political implications, and um, you know uh, the the place the I, I and I was completely fascinated with the descriptions like of of the birds and the animals and the in in the mountains of people describing places that never existed and so what I did I I I collected I collected at the beginning all the um, um, all, all, all these paragraphs where these islands are mentioned in the original logbooks. Um, and I, I ordered them this um, to create um, a new story um, in which the only thing that I erased it was the name of a particular island. So, um, so it becomes on this story about um, a nameless island, but it's actually with the text of all the islands that are um, in, in, in showed at the exhibition. And um, I, I encourage you to, to take a look. Um, and, I mean, for me, it's, uh, it's fascinating and I, I keep it, I keep it the, the story with an uh, open ending um, about um, this story that they're looking, they're, they're, in, they're in the search for an island, they, they sink, then they disappear, and it is not really, um, it is not really with a clear uh, closure if this place exists or not. Um, this is um, uh, Liliana. Just um, I, I love everything you're saying, but we have a few questions from the audience as well. If you would like to answer those, just because we want to keep to time, so everyone has time. Sure, sure. This is, I just want to see this uh, screenshot, and I open to. To, of course, for any questions. Um, 
Great, we have one question from Ben um, who just wanted a clarification about whether or not you experimented with segmentation algorithms um, when you manually traced. Um, uh, no, I was, uh, it was uh, just uh, labor hours of, of placing the, um, uh, the images, um, uh, which is a screenshot, opening Photoshop in a different layer, I would trace them erase the the uh, the layer of the um, of the screenshot and this will be it was maybe <laughs> maybe there was a better way to do it um, and that will save me some hundreds of hours but sadly I didn't uh, I, I wasn't aware um, and another question uh, from Jenny, which I also have as well, is did you self did you self teach machine learning, and what difficult difficulties have you come across during that learning process? If so, sure. so uh, in uh, grad school, I took um, a course on machine learning. Um, it is still very complicated. <laughs> so um, I I took uh, an open source algorithm. And with um, with the knowledge I uh, I acquired in in that course, um, I managed to um, to 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 take it and, and train it myself. Um, the 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 most difficult thing for me was um, there were I couldn't use my computer uh, because I didn't have a GPU, so I had to. Um, to rent a computer and set everything, and the setup was was um, this, a lot of things was were missing, and you know scripts and stuff. This was most uh, complicated for me. All right, thank you. I I have many questions myself, um, but we will circle back at the end um, again. So if anyone has um, other questions for Liliana, you will have a chance at the end of all the talks to ask again. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for the time. And um, our next artist. Um, um, our next artist um, will be Julieta Hill. Um, and I will pin you as well. She um, is the winner of our gold award this year for Nuesta Victoria, Our Victory. Um, she's a digital artist based in Mexico City. Um, and I will let her take the floor. And just so everyone um, is aware of format, each of our artists have about 15, 20 minutes to talk. Um, and during which um, audience, please feel free to write questions in the chat for them. And then I will feed them questions following their, their talk. Um, and then at the very end, as I mentioned before, um, we'll have a chance to talk to all of the artists at the same time. So if you don't get a chance to have your question answered, um, it can be answered at the end. Um, so I will pin Julieta. Hi, Julieta. Hi, thank you, Sophie. Um, I'm going to share my screen as well. Um, and I'm just going to keep this playing while I talk a little bit about uh, my work and uh, this specific project. Uh, so my work has to do a lot uh, with uh, researching the history about monuments. And uh, through this research, I try to bring the past into the future. And I try to kind of imagine um, possible, possible ways of kind of reimagining uh, monuments in the way that we kind of conceive them. And through my work, I mostly use uh, 3D simulation and I, I work with different techniques. And so in, in this case, in the case of uh, Nuestra Victoria, um, I'm just gonna keep this looping. Nuestra Victoria is a project that uh, started from a very prominent monument in Mexico City that is uh, called the Angel of Independence. And 
this monument was built to commemorate 100 years of independence uh, back in the 19, beginning of the 1900s. And it's the place where people kind of gather around uh, to celebrate victories or to protest. Uh, so it's a place of gathering and it's probably the most important monument in, in the country. And uh, this project started back in August of 2019 uh, after several protests around uh, problems of systemic violence happening in the country where around 10 women are killed uh, every day here in Mexico because of gender related violence. And this was the first time that a group of protesters kind of took the monument and actually uh, just kind of decided to write over it and to kind of claim it and make it theirs. And after this happened, uh, hours later, the monument was boarded up. And so nobody could really see any of the writings that were uh, put on it. And this is how kind of my, my idea of doing a 3D documentation began because for me it was kind of very frustrating to not be able to see uh, what had happened because of the this is just a very important movement right now and I thought that you know ways of kind of using technology as an act of resistance and using technology as a way to kind of have conversations about what the future of monuments is or how we imagine them serving us as a society and I decided to do this uh, documentation using a technique called photogrammetry, which basically consists of taking hundreds of uh, photographs of an object, uh, a physical object. And then with these photographs, there are algorithms that are able to reconstruct the object in three-dimensional form. And so this took like a lot of, um, kind of meticulous work of, of drone footage then being converted into images that were then converted into many different sections of the monument that had to afterwards get uh, stitched together to recreate uh, this image. And uh, throughout this process, I kind of was thinking a lot about uh, what my Kind of input would be as an artist because for me the most important thing was to actually have this uh, document you know to be able to freeze this moment in time and have it exist in history uh, and this was just kind of a, a response to an action of the government wanting to actually erase this image in history you know so that no one could see it and um, after that you know, I, I really thought, you know, as an artist, there was not much I could add to this because it was already kind of a collective artwork that I was uh, just documenting. And so my, my intervention in it was really uh, subtle. It was about kind of illuminating this, this monument, uh, holding it in a kind of sacred virtual space where it could exist and not disappear. And Besides this, I think that uh, there were like many different outputs that I worked with. And so this is one of the outputs, which is a video where you can just see the monument kind of rotating uh, in 360 degrees. Uh, there are other still images that kind of frame closer to certain aspects of the monument. And the idea of this is also to kind of think of ways that we could uh, re-signify uh, something that already exists and has a prior meaning. And another thing that was very important for me was to also kind of reveal the technology behind this process. So I didn't want it to be, you know, like entirely uh, perfect and impeccable. I really wanted to show some of the mistakes that occur when, uh, when producing this photogrammetry technique. And so you can see, for example, in, in the bottom or the base that there are like certain holes or imperfections uh, occurring. And you can also see 
parts of the monument, like you can see the stitches or the process of where things got joined together. And another thing too, is that uh, this original monument has uh, angel in the top part that I kind of decided to not document. Uh, I wanted to really focus on the base of the monument, because for me, this is really where we can see what happens when you know civil society uh, takes takes up a space and becomes a part of it and actually occupies it. And for me, this is the real importance that monuments should have. So I wanted to really focus on on the base of it uh, to kind of emphasize this idea. And. Um, again, all of these other kind of imperfections too, for me, kind of talk about also the, the fragility of this monument, you know, and, and how these, these things that are kind of set in stone, these ideas that are set in stone uh, can also easily fall apart. And so it's kind of also pointing towards a future where maybe we kind of take ideas of patriarchy and break them apart and kind of start to rebuild upon new values that actually represent us as a society. Great, thank you so much. And if anyone has questions for Julieta, please uh, put them in the chat. Um, I actually wanted to ask a question um, myself, just in terms of the exhibition with Leonardo on one of, um, on one of the walls they put, um, or the curators, and I, I don't know how involved um, you were in this selection, but just um, an image of one of the facades, um, just kind of like a still image that looks at like kind of the, the architectural detail and not at the graffiti itself. And I, I wondered if you could comment on, on that, like the difference between preserving the artwork that was put on the thing versus kind of reproducing the thing itself in this technique that you've used um, and the choice of, of putting that in the exhibition. Sure, I mean, I think the, the architecture itself, I think has a lot of meaning because it, it, this was designed uh, during a dictatorship in, in Mexico and it's a monument to the heroes of the independence and so uh, if we analyze this first layer of the monument, it uh, basically has many uh, different characters. Most of the, the male characters or the statues that are in this monument are actual heroes of the independence and they existed. So they were real uh, heroes. Whereas uh, the women portrayed uh, in, in these statues are kind of myths. You know, they represent certain symbols, but they don't really exist and they didn't really exist. So uh, I think this is also kind of, you know, this other layer from the past that is talking a lot uh, and adding, you know, to this conversation that uh, women are trying to have nowadays uh, and specifically in this, this movement uh, in Mexico, this feminist movement, it's about, uh, you know, ending, ending kind of this violence and ending this idea that we don't have a voice uh, and, you know, kind of trying to uh, eliminate our voices or our presence. And so for me, it was really interesting to see how these layers of the past and the present are kind of coming together and trying to have a conversation. Thank you. I would love to put you in conversation also eventually with Liliana, because I think both of you kind of are engaging with these like non-existent or no longer existent, um, like visualizing these things that, that are kind of in this like between space, um, really interesting. But I um, will come back to you um, at the end. So if other people um, think of more questions um, for both of them at the end, we will revisit. Um, but thank you so much, Julieta. Sure. And, um, and our next artist is Soren Craig, um, who won our Nordic Award um, this year, which was a new award um, that was offered in partnership with SKMU, um, which is a regional and contemporary art museum in Norway. 
Um, and uh, Sorin took home the award for De Mille Fleurs, which is, um, translates to 2000 Flowers, um, a tapestry installation. Um, and I will let him take it away. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, this is going to be my first uh, Zoom based uh, artist talk. So I hope everything is going to be all right, but I'm going to try and uh, share my screen. Uh, I, at least I thought I was going to do that. Um, All right. Uh, I've, are you guys seeing like kind of a colorful, blurry blue and red image? Great. So uh, basically, um, what I do or where I come from uh, with my art is that I um, I work with sort of um, quite uh, unsophisticated uh, image software to create what I call digital painting. So it's basically something akin to glitch art, but where glitch art is usually based on some kind of uh, source image, I sort of have, have no input like that. And um, I think that has led for me at least to thinking about images uh, in a certain way, uh, namely, as being made up of uh, these things called pixels. So basically uh, little squares. The other thing I do is um, digital weaving. So basically taking a, um, a digital image and then through assigning bindings uh, and choosing yarn and all sorts of other things, uh, that digital image can be turned into a, um, a jacquard woven tapestry. Uh, so this is another work of mine. Um, but yeah, so, and this is the work. Um, probably most people have seen it by now, I can go back. But uh, yeah, so I think this project for me actually started way back in 2015. Always because of my sort of affinity for pixels and this kind of like square format, I've always had an interest in Roman mosaics and by extension sort of Byzantine mosaics. Uh, and in 2015, I had the privilege of going to Ravenna in Northern Italy, where you can find some of the most sort of um, amazing uh, Byzantine uh, mosaics. And among that in the Gala Pasidia Mausoleum, there is a, a ceiling which is uh, covered by stars and uh, observers might see that these stars sort of uh, resemble the, the flowers in my carpet. But uh, I think when I think about this, um, uh, these mosaics, there is sort of a, an element of constructivism. They say, uh, what is the star or what is a flower? And for me, basically, I boiled it down to being um, a symmetrical shape. Uh, made up of colors and for example uh, when the bumblebee goes to find food it will not necessarily look for the biggest flower but uh, the bumblebee uh, pays most attention to which flowers are more symmetrical so uh, in art as well our flowers are perhaps among the most uh, ubiquitous uh, motifs so um, it's it's never uh, it was never far from my mind, um, and so while I was learning how to do uh, digital weaving, I became more interested in sort of the history of text art and uh, especially uh, tapestry, and in the sort of tradition of medieval and Renaissance tapestry, um, there is uh, this phenomenon, Mille Fleurs, which my piece is named after, which, as Sophie said, 
as, uh, means uh, a thousand flowers. And it basically refers to the background in uh, these tapestries. Uh, and what I found out after studying it a little closer was that in the sort of image making of tapestries, there was uh, always a hierarchy. So you would have um, uh, the artist, the drawer, the, the painter who would make the cartoon, uh, which would have all the uh, characters uh, that would be in the tapestry. Uh, and while that was also um, obviously a lot of work, the brunt of the work and what really took a long time was actually weaving the carpets. And that was down to the weavers. Um, but often the, uh, the cartoons that were given to the weavers were not fully fleshed out. So there might be paths where they, it was assumed that there would be a uh, no fleur. And in these areas, uh, the weavers were allowed to just kind of uh, do their thing. Um, so I thought that, that that was sort of an interesting division of labor. Uh, and I, of course, being very interested in the flowers, but also interested in this tradition thought, why don't I just omit the figures altogether and, and just have the flowers? And that's sort of when I started to play around with making these uh, flower shapes. At this point, uh, I got in touch with a uh, wonderful guy that you see here, my friend Jonathan, who is uh, an engineer. Um, he usually works with, uh, using these weird robots to test the strength of uh, airplane wings. Uh, but he also does quite a bit of programming. I was kind of uh, going on about these flowers. And I, say, and I said, couldn't we just kind of make an algorithm that, make, uh, that makes these shapes? Um, and so basically, the sort of the, the very sort of final points of the programming I can't speak to, but basically uh, what was done was creating uh, these, this function where we would have a certain space that would be filled and that would be filled according to uh, the parameters that, that we found to sort of make up the nicest flowers. And also, so basically it would fill squares like this with the different colors. And after that, uh, it would be uh, mirrored around itself, creating the flower shape. And so after that, um, I, I uh, in paint, I took all these 2000 flowers in, um, and then I worked for a while with um, creating the border that you see, uh, not only because that is sort of a traditional thing to have in a tapestry, but also to sort of, strengthen like the, the physical integrity of the tapestry on the sides by simply having this pattern where uh, more of the uh, different yarns come to the surface and that sort of uh, strengthens the, uh, the textile itself. Um, and yeah, this is from one of the very first tests that I did on a uh, manual digital loom to kind of determine uh, basically what the background would be, would be like. Another thing to take into consideration when you're weaving as opposed to printing, uh, printing an image or something like that, where in an image you can sort of have pretty much as many colors as you like. Uh, in the loom, you are limited to colors that you can create either by two color yarns sort of interacting or um, simply by having the uh, one yarn interact with the warp threads, that are, those are the threads coming um, uh, vertically towards us. Um, so basically, when you get to have an insert of uh, four colors of yarn, as I have in this work, uh, it starts to get more difficult to create the uh, um, the textile because any yarn that is not on the face of the weaving has to be planned out so that it is somewhere inside or, or on the back. And you can imagine as soon as you have many layers of, of yarn, it gets uh, 
more and more difficult to sort of um, maintain the, the structure. Um, but I think that might be uh, just about what I have to say, if anybody has questions. Great, thank you, Soren. Um, I don't see any specific questions. I, I did have one of my own, um, but I wanna wait and see. And also if anyone has questions um, for uh, the three artists in general, we can open the floor now as well. Um, but but Soren, I also wanted to touch kind of on this idea of image hierarchy that you, in your artist statement, you write um, like in an effort to further extrapolate this reversal of the image hierarchy. And I think that kind of struck me because I think image hierarchy, even in the context of digital art, and digital art is kind of this up and coming um, idea and you omit narrative also in your work. And I, I was just wondering what to you is like the new narrative, if there is one, because I don't, I don't know if, if you just want complete no narrative, if, you know, what to you is, what are you creating out of that reversal? Bit of a long-winded. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, I, I love narrative, uh, but I think it's, it takes just like some, some, some chops at drawing, basically, if you want to create a narrative. And I've never sort of been very good at representational drawing. So it's kind of a constructivism by default for me in a way. But I think mm -hmm. also by sort of, this is one of the first major woven pieces that I did. So it was also sort of a personal kind of leveling of the playing field to create a, a starting point where other things might uh, grow from uh, later. Um, and certainly, I think, I don't know, maybe there's uh, like a ghost of a weaver somewhere who's like, yeah, finally, you know, we're sticking it to the cartoonists, but uh, who knows? <laughs> I hope there is a ghost out there. Um, we did have one question um, for you as well, which is what was the biggest challenge um, in creating the weavings um, physically or otherwise? The biggest challenge? Um... I mean, I think the the work with with the bindings is usually like that's a lot of less maybe uh, when you're or usually when I'm doing my my glitch paintings, it's uh, it's a quite of uh, it's almost like an expressionistic thing where I'm just sort of doing it, but with uh with planning bindings it's really very quite methodical and and even mathematical so you just have to like hunker down and try to plan that um usually in digital weaving you will have uh, a lot more bindings in a piece uh, than i have in mind to render a lot more sort of nuanced uh, colors but I think it was also a part of my statement that I would only have these uh, six different bindings all together to sort of maintain the sort of uh, minimalism and maximalism, if uh, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Um, I also have a question and I, I think it's for Julieta. Um, so Soren, thank you. Um, and um, it's from Jonathan and it, and it says, once digitized, you have a lot of control over the scale. You can domesticate it into a tiny object or make it have a huge scale. How did the possibilities of scale impact um, as you were making this work? Um, that would be for Julieta, though I think it also probably applies to all of you. Um, I mean, definitely being able to kind of uh, work with different uh, scales is something great about uh, this medium. And for me, one of the, the things that were very important was to be able to preserve uh, the legibility of all of the tags and writings on the monument. And uh, other than this, I have actually tried uh, 
very different outputs of the, the work. And they have to do a lot more with the context of where they're being shown. Uh, and so, for example, I've been able to print this image at a monumental scale and have it, I think it was in a photography festival in Spain, and they were able to put it onto a facade. Uh, I've also kind of been able to work with uh, larger screens and make this a two channel video installation. So I think, uh, I mean, in terms of scale, the most important for, thing for me is to be able to preserve the writing. So have the image be uh, large enough so that you can see the writing. And then other than this, it really has much more to do with the context of where the work is being presented. I also made this into a poster, for example, and printed these out uh, and kind of gave them away uh, during a protest that happened uh, last March. So yeah, I guess it has to do more with the context of where it's being shown. Um, does anyone else um, want to tackle a question about, about scale and how it might be relevant to their work? I think um, that possibly might apply to both our other artists as well, but if not, um, we can move on to another question. Um, yeah, I mean... Uh, um, <laughs> looking at it, and sorry. Um, there was a limitation of the, of the resolution that I could get from uh, from this image processing, and the bigger the resolution, um, the um, in size was um, the the uh, the less sort of um, veracity I, I I received from the algorithm, and I had all these different patterns that will 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 come uh, from trying to stretch to to create a, an image is so big. Uh, but I kind of like them. Um, these images are, are small, and especially when I present them in the physical world, they're quite small. Because there are these, um, you know, these this forgotten little guys, you know, that survived uh, sort of hiding in, in there, in, in between. Uh, and they're, 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 they're not big, they're these, these little these mistakes that I'm trying to uh, bring light to. And Sorin, did you have a comment as well? Uh, yeah, just about uh, scale. Um, that's definitely something that I sort of have to deal with uh, on a regular basis when you're sort of your beginning product is, is a virtual thing. Uh, it's very ab abstract to say like, well, how big is it? Um, but then I think for me, working with uh, with weaving and, and with tapestry has been very satisfying in a way that that is sort of uh, almost the opposite of a virtual thing. It's a very sort of real tactile thing that you can deal with. Uh, but the work itself in its woven form, uh, it was pretty much determined by I needed to have the information of the flowers and I sort of and the flower is made up of these uh, uh, square pixel shapes. So I basically had to find out what is the minimal, how small can I make the individual detail on the carpet? And that will be one pixel. So the image that went into the weaving, which you can actually also see inside of the wonderful virtual exhibition, uh, that image originally, uh, which became the weaving, if you have it open in some kind of, uh, uh, image software it's about the size of a small postcard and now it's and the weaving is almost six meters so yeah size is uh it's interesting uh, thank you jonathan for that question it's a good one um i i also had a question that i know i think all three of you were also a part of um, the talk um, during the opening of the exhibition as well. And um, I remember um, Diana of Leonardo talking um, very eloquently during that talk about um, this idea of like, we must be the change. And she was quoting Gandhi kind of, but I was just wondering if in all three of your works, um, if 
you are looking to quote unquote change something, if that resonated with you, I think Liliana, you're looking at geopolitics, to Julieta reclaiming and soaring kind of this image hierarchy. So I, I don't know if um, what Diana was talking about resonated with you as well. Well, I, I, I can say um, for myself, um, um, it is, it, it's not that I, with my work, I, I intend to uh, change something specific, but I think um, I am part of from a generation of artists that are trying to um, um, help uh, users um, um, of, of informational systems to be uh, more critical and, and aware of, of the, um, in the platforms and you know, the, the, um, the algorithms they use, the products, and, and to um, be more uh, skeptical of. Um, so I think that's, uh, I, I see that as, as, uh, as my role. Okay, she's okay, I like that. Um, I, I think also that, you know, if we are using technology and these tools, uh, following up a little bit with Liliana's comment, I think we, we have to also think critically about them. And we have the capacity to create images, you know, as artists. And if, if we don't feel represented by the images that exist uh, today, we have also the capacity to create new images and new symbols that uh, better represent us. And if we can actually think of technology as uh, one of these uh, means uh, that to create new images, I think that it becomes a very powerful way of uh, thinking about it and using it. Um, Story, if you want to add as well, but we also have um, an additional comment um, from Gustavo Rincon, um, who is one of the producers of the exhibition, um, and he writes, please, um, if all three of you would want to speak about how technology has influenced your artistic practice um, or process just in general, um, and what is the future for your investigations and algorithms or to narratives, um, and how have current times specifically influenced um, your kind of impulse towards creativity? It's a big question <laughs> that you can think about. Uh, maybe I can start and also talk a little bit about the, the last thing. Um, yeah. I think this piece for me in particular might be obvious that it's uh, it's mostly about sort of uh, um, aesthetic experience and sort of aesthetic knowledge. So uh, while I, that is something that I have worked with and something that I appreciate a lot when people deal with more concretely with uh, uh, maybe more timely political things, I think for me also just personally, sometimes there is a value to almost sort of switching off in a way and just hyper focusing on aesthetics and i think once you're sort of go into that and you come out on the other side you sometimes find that you inadvertently have uh, sort of touched upon some of these things uh gustavo asks something about um what influence technology has on on the on artistic practices and for me with this project, it's very much sort of trying to show the uh, what you could call the amalgamation of all these different visual traditions that I see and that I have in my head. So the artwork doesn't only speak to the aesthetics of um, of these old tapestries, but it very much speaks to sort of my internalized aesthetic of the sort of digital age that we're in, uh, in a way. Um, and I just wanna add if others want to also respond um, to Gustavo's question, um, 
the, the end part of it is asking kind of about the responsibility of the artist um, in current times and how it, technology influences that. I think that's uh, important to add. Um, um, what, uh, what I could say is um, um, the, 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 I first, I am a user of the systems that I'm trying to, to work with. Um, so I'm a regular uh, at Google Earth. Um, and, and I'm just always like led by curiosity of, of the algorithms in the, in the industry and in trying to understand how they work and, um, and um, what are the particular uh, uh, designs of these of these algorithms, and how can I how can I uh, make them uh, how can I expose them? And in thinking about these current times uh, in in this specific work, you know um, there is a, a big um, um, debate of of what truth is, especially in the U.S. now. Um, and well, while um, almost half of the population believes um, um, the opposite of the other half and um, to be truth. And, and um, what are the, um, the roles of algorithms in, in to define uh, a narrative, uh, if, even if it is um, through what it's called the filter bubble, you know, in, in social media, this a channel of, of people informing themselves, but also what are the manipulations of uh, a particular image processing that can, that can create a alternative a narratives. And in my, my work, I explore um, in the, the possibility of, uh, of, of manipulation. And, and for me, you know, um, it is interesting. I don't have um I don't have um a, an answer for what to do with this crisis of truth, and my work for sure doesn't doesn't solve, but uh, but raises uh, more questions of um of trust in in, in the big uh, enterprises that that produce uh, the narratives for for users. Um, I think in my case, uh, thinking about photogrammetry and other techniques such as LiDAR scanning, for example, more and more of our physical world is being digitized. And I think, again, like in my practice, uh, I have more open-ended questions than actual answers. Uh, but I think that it's important to actually start raising these questions. I mean, what are the what are the things that we are deciding to digitize? You know, what what are we going to kind of preserve uh, in in the future in in this kind of virtual digitized space? And and then once digitized, what will be the role of these physical uh, remains? So, what will monuments work for? Or um, I don't know. There's a lot of uh, work being done with archaeology too and scans of ruins that are being kind of discovered in many parts of the world and again like if, if they're already being discovered for example with lighter scanning will we even have to physically uncover them or do they just remain as this virtual ruin uh, so i think uh, at least for myself as an artist, it, it starts to become interesting when, when I understand the technologies that I'm working with and the way that it's being used uh, in society and governments, and then kind of question that use, you know, and, and maybe point to other directions or other questions. Thank uh Thank you to all of you. And um, we have one final question um, about how the programs you use become a part of your subject matter. Um, if anyone wants to take that on. Um, so program software, um, computers, how, how does 
using those kind of influence what you choose to tackle subject wise. I mean, in, in my case, I think it's interesting to think of uh, photogrammetry as a technique that is kind of post photographic and the possibilities of this because you're working with a representation, but you can also manipulate it and bring it into a space of, of fiction. And then again, this kind of uh, brings me back to what Liliana was talking about uh, ideas of truth and what is truth now. And so I think even using this technique in that way kind of reveals the way that images are constructed now and how we can really uh, manipulate and create narratives that are, you know, can be used for raising our awareness, but they can also be used uh, for more negative things too. Thank you for that answer. If anyone else wants to respond, um, you can do so. Well, uh, I think I, I started uh, um, I, to respond about this question before when I said that um, um, I, I am, a, um, in this case, uh, I'm a Google Earth user and my, my research uh, starts from, from the use of, of the platform. In general, I am um, I am um, a user of the things that I that I really try to criticize. Um, but it, it was interesting, like working um, with the, the machine learning algorithm uh, through the process and trying to also understand how how this uh, black box worked. You know, trying to do they said there is a black box because once you put the the like the data sort of it works on its own um but i but i had uh, i tried to have a process that i show with the with the little hard islands um to try to understand if i change something uh what will be the result and what would need to um, uh, work in order to, to have the, the expected uh result so it was um a ping pong uh with the, this entity um, trying to, to uh, create together um, what I wanted. Um, thank you. And thank you to all three of you. Um, Gustavo asked, what is truth? What is history? And I think um, those are all questions wrapped up in what all three of you do. And um, I would encourage um, anyone watching um, to join us again next Tuesday um, with more of our artists where we will ask um, similar questions. Um, similar big questions and specific questions. Um, but thank you all for your time. Um, and I'm sure we will see you again on a similar platform.